the Buddha discovered the path. The first factor he discovered was right concentration. And then as he worked at right concentration, he found that other factors had to come in to support it. These are called the requisites or supports of right concentration. It's, they start with right view all the way through right mindfulness. But they all converge here. And it's good to think about how they keep bringing you back right here. Right concentration is focused on one thing, it's singleness of mind. Focused on an object like the breath. And as the Buddha describes it, you drop your interest in sensual pleasures. In other words, you're not escaping from sensual pleasures. We don't have to go off and find some place that's really painful to stay. It's simply while you're in this state, you're not really interested in them. You're not interested in sensual desires. You want to just be right here with a sense of the body as you feel it inside. That's called rupa, or form. Thoughts of sensuality just drop away, or you let them drop away. Any unskillful states of mind, you let them drop away. And the fact that you're secluded from those things, that in and of itself gives a nice sense of ease. Essential desires put you on fire. There's always a sense of lack that goes with the desire. And even when you gain the object of the desire, you know how precarious it is. So there's a sense of instability. The mind can't find any real peace that way. There's a passage where the Buddha says there's no other pleasure, there's no other ease than stillness, peace. And we can think of all kinds of pleasures that aren't very peaceful. Each of them is a pleasure because the, the mind can stay there for a while. That's the peace the Buddha is talking about. And the problem is these pleasures don't let you stay very long. If you want a sense of real well-being, you have to find something that allows you to stay here. So the breath is a good place to be. It helps you explore the body from within. It gives you a tool for dealing with problems in the circulation in the body, problems of the energy flow in the body. As you work with the breath energy in the different parts of the body, it's good for those parts of the body. When the mind has a good place to stay, it's willing to settle down. It can begin to melt into the present moment instead of being tensed up and ready to spring off. So the Buddha said, you have directed thought and you have evaluation. And John Lee divides the factors of John into two sorts. They're the causes. You're sitting here thinking about the breath, trying to get the breath good. Well, that's called directed thought and evaluation. And you stick with it, and it's the only thing you're concerned about. Other ideas may come jumping at you and demanding your attention like little dogs. But you don't have to pay them attention. You don't pay them attention. After a while, they say there's no food there, and they go away. Now it helps to have the right attitude in order to maintain this, and this is where the, the other factors of the path come in. First, there's the right view. It reminds you the big issue in life is suffering. Where does the suffering come from? It comes from the mind. Why does it come from the mind? It's because the mind is ignorant of itself. So this is why we practice concentration. This is why you're here. You want to learn about yourself right here to see what you're doing that's causing unnecessary suffering. As for right resolve, that has a very close connection with right concentration. In fact, there's another passage in the canon where the Buddha talks about starting with right resolve and leading to right concentration was the way he found the path. He realized he could divide his thoughts into two sorts, those concerned with sensual desire, ill will, harmfulness on the one hand, and renunciation lack of ill will, lack of harmfulness on the other side. In other words, he looked at his thoughts not in terms of their content, but in terms of what they would do. 
He realized that the first sort would lead to affliction for himself or to others. The other sort wouldn't lead to affliction to anybody. So he would try to hold and check those first ones in the same way he would want to keep a herd of cows out of a field of rice. As for the others, he allowed them to wander as they liked. Like a herd of cows, when the rice has been harvested and there's no danger, they're going to get into trouble. But even then, he said, you think about those good thoughts, and it can wear the mind out. Because that's what led him to want to go further, get the mind even more still through right concentration. And while you're in right concentration, it's an embodiment of right resolve. You're not concerned with sensual thoughts. You have no ill will for anybody, no harmful, harmfulness. This is a good place to be. The various precepts about right action, right speech, right livelihood, those allow you to settle down in the present moment and not suddenly get startled by the memory of something you've done that's been harmful. Now, there may have been harmful things you've done way in the past before you started taking the precepts. But you realize you've drawn a line. You've made up your mind you're not going to go in that direction any, anymore. And there's a sense of well-being that comes from that determination. That, too, feeds the right concentration. Right effort, of course, is part of the path, along with right mindfulness, that lead directly into right concentration. You start out with the desire to abandon unskillful thoughts that have arisen to prevent any unskillful ones from arising that haven't arisen yet, to give rise to skillful mental states and to maintain them and develop them. Notice it's the desire there. It's a good thing. This is the kind of desire you want to you want to foster, because otherwise your desires will pull you all, all over the place, away from your concentration. This is why it's good to read about the Ajans, it's good to read about people who have practiced, who, that you find inspiring. People are not too far away, not too distant in the sense of seeming superhuman. It's good to read about people who are human, who have practiced the, the path that you're following. Because our society gives us other models to follow. And we have to fight against a lot of those. The ones that say, you're a loser if you don't make a lot of money, if you don't go running over people. Or the ones that say you have to go out and helping other people all the time. Even though that second one sounds good, it can get you frazzled and leave you with nothing. And after all, you, you suffer burnout. What Kurt Vonnegut said, Samaratrophia. In other words, your good Samaritan ideas begin to atrophy because you're just worn out. You don't have the strength to keep it up. So you remind yourself, good, a good state of right concentration is a good place to nourish your strength. So you see, when you think about the various factors of the path, they all point in here. Or the qualities that you develop as you're developing those factors, they point in here as well. For instance, with right speech and right action. If you're going to maintain the precepts, you have to be very mindful, you have to be very alert to what you're doing to make sure it doesn't go against the precepts. Mindfulness is what keeps the precept in mind. And you have to be ardent. You see that you have some old habitual ways of doing things that get in the way of the precepts and they're really easy and it just seems like you're sliding into them. You've got to put up a wall and say no. You have to learn how to do that effectively. You're developing a lot of the qualities you're going to need to get the mind to settle down, particularly that mindful, alert, ardent. Those come into the factor of right mindfulness. You keep one topic in mind. It can be the body in and of itself. Notice the in and of itself. That also talks about the idea of being secluded. You're not thinking about the body in terms of the world, how good it looks, or how much work it's able to do out there in the world. You're thinking about it just now here's a body. This is what it feels like to be with a body, to inhabit a body. Then you're ardent, alert, and mindful to stay with a body in and of itself. Now, you, one of the ways of doing that is 
being with the breath. So you get into the sense of inhabiting the form of your body, finding pleasure just being in the form. But there are energies of the form flowing together. All these factors come together right here. The mind is tempted to wander out. If you've got those factors around you like a fence, they'll divert you and bring you right back in. In the meantime, they strengthen qualities that you're going to need to stay right here. So you're right here at the right spot. And those other factors are supports or requisites to help you stay here in a way that's really solid and direct your attention to what needs to be done. And you can use concentration for all kinds of things. But as the Buddha said, the best use of it is to figure out this problem of suffering. Why is it that we keep causing ourselves suffering? Exactly what is the suffering that weighs us down? Well, it's the suffering we create. The suffering that comes in through the senses, not so much. It's when we take that, say, the pain from outside or the disappointment from outside, and we use it to stab the heart, that activity of stabbing. Like, why are we doing that? Can we stop? The Buddha says, when you can answer this question, you've answered a lot of other questions as well. At the same time, you've learned how not to be a burden to other people. See so, you know, how the factors of the path support you in getting into right concentration and then remind you of what it's useful for. This way, all the factors of the path support one another, and they support you. And you desire how, wanting to make sense of all this, this life that we have. Having a sense of what we can do with it, the best, way, <clears throat> the best use we can make of our lives. It all starts right here.